Um, I'm really sorry I'm not with you today, and the reason I would have been looking forward to it, but the reason I'm not with you, as strange as it could sound, is because of how much I do care for missionaries. Um, over the last number of years, God's given me the privilege of meeting with missionaries, counseling with them uh, on the field, and as it turns out, um, my plane tickets had just required me departing um, the day before I was supposed to be with you, because in some of the places I'm going, flights don't go every day, and I just had to be there on time. But I want you even to note that my absence is a statement of uh, the value of who you are and what you do to me. Um, I want to share a very important truth, very important to me. I hope you will see uh, its significance to you. And to do it, I want to ask you a question. Um, I'm aiming especially at those of you who are serving on the field or you just know in your heart that you're serving God wherever you're at. Um, why is it that God called you? Why you? Wouldn't it surprise me if you've thought about that sometimes. Wouldn't it surprise me if you've come up with some answers about that sometimes. Maybe an answer that I'm going to suggest to you will be the same as yours, but it's very possible not. Um... Because the truth is, when I am face-to-face -face with folks and ask them, why do you think God chose you? <clears throat> they typically say something like, well, because God gave me certain gifts, and God needed those gifts to accomplish um, the advancing of his kingdom or the building of his church, um, and that God needed you and those gifts wherever it is that you're serving. I want to propose a different notion I don't want to devalue the importance of your gifts, but, it, but I do believe that there's a deeper reason for you having been chosen. I'm looking at the book of Mark. I'm looking at uh, chapter 3. And I want to begin reading in verse 7. It just says, it says here, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. So here's Jesus. He's having some success in his ministry. Large crowd is following him. And in verse 13, he says something I want to key in on today. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. Point number one. You are called not primarily because you're needed, you are called primarily because you're wanted. Let that soak in. The Lord himself wants you. Now maybe that overdeveloped servant part of you, because missionaries tend to have that overdeveloped, says, yeah, 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 yes, of course he wants me, so that he can use my gifts. And so really it's just saying the same thing. No, 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 bear with me. He calls them those he wanted. They came to him. He appointed 12, designating, designating them apostles. Now, apostle's a big word. That's a powerful word. That's that's heavy responsibility word. So obviously he has gifts or the task in mind here. Listen to his motivation. That they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. Please notice the order. Number one, they're called. And in a moment, their, their particular names are mentioned. That you're called on a first name basis because you're wanted primarily to be with and, yes, there's a task to preach. Would you be willing to consider that the reason why God put his hand on your life, the reason Jesus called you, is number one, because you're wanted and sent you to wherever it is you're serving because that was the place he was going to draw you apart from where you were to be with him. And yes, there's a task to do, a church to be built, ministries to be operated and so forth, but that comes after knowing you're wanted and he just wants to be with. Now, just in case you think that um, I've picked just a few verses in one little part of the Bible, allow me to um, give you a foundation for my understanding of uh, the heart of God and to tell you a story from the Old Testament which really drove this home for me some years back now. So let me ask you another question. What do you think it is that makes heaven heaven for God? 
not heaven for you, not heaven for me, you know, not the big banquet, you know, that I might look forward to on a day when I'm hungry, or if I happen to be poverty stricken, not the gold streets. What makes heaven heaven for God? Well, I believe that the scripture answers that, and I want to read that for you. It's in Revelation 21. It's a relatively familiar passage. When John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I want to come back to that word sea in a moment. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. Let me pause there. I want to paraphrase one word there, and I think it won't be a violation of the spirit of the word. Number one, because it's, this is being said in a loud voice. There's a lot of energy in this statement. It's not the energy of anger, because we're talking about a picture of a bride and a groom. This isn't anger. This is the loudness of excitement. This is the loudness of an exclamation at the end of the anticipating for however long of a bride and groom being together. And so I, the word I want to insert is finally. God is saying finally. The dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They, is, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You hear the word that's getting repeated there? With, with, with. The same word we heard. Why did he call the twelve? To be with him. You want, you want to know what moves the heart of God about you? The notion of being with. And he is so looking forward to that ultimate, always with, never separated day, that he just exclaims it in a loud voice. I mentioned the word see there. I wanted to come back to that. <clears throat> if I was writing a picture of heaven, I would want to include a sea. I, would want, I, I might even set the holy city on the sea coast. I don't know why in the heart of God he, uh, it, it's made a point to say there was no more sea, but I can imagine relatively easily why it was in the heart of John to notice there was no more sea. Number one, John is called the apostle of love. He knew what it was like to feel the love of Jesus. He, was, he described himself as the one whom Jesus loved. And if you look at his epistles, it's not unusual that his authoritative emphasis is on love, how we love each other. This is a man who loved. He knew what it was like to be loved and to love others. When John was um, sentenced by the Romans for the crime of preaching the gospel, it's very possible that there could have been no more torturous punishment for him than the one he got, which was to be placed on an island, banished, in exile from those that he loved. What a heavenly aspect it is for John to know that when I get to heaven, there's no more sea. There's no more separation from me and the ones I love, from the Lord and us. The emphasis of what makes heaven heaven is withness. Now let me tell you a story. Some years ago, I uh, read the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And one of the habits he mentioned in there um, was begin with the end in mind. To be honest with you, I think the end in mind that God started with was this withness. But I want to mention one of the other habits that I want to focus on now, and that was be proactive. Well, when I read that book, my heart was stirred. Boy, I wanted the uh, effective life, and I decided I was going to practice some of these principles. And one of the areas I needed to be more effective in was in this area of uh, prayer. I talked about it, said my prayers along the way, but was inadequate, in my opinion, at just having intentional and enough time in prayer. So... Following another one of his principles, um, putting the big rocks in first, um, I, um, I decided I'm going to put prayer on the calendar. And so I put a repeating appointment during uh, the week to, um, to schedule prayer in. And I, I scheduled it an hour. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And I remember going to my office that first day I had it scheduled, and I sat down in my chair, and I began to pray, and I expressed my heart to the Lord, and... And then I thought, what am I going to do for the next 59 or 58 minutes? What more do I need to say? What more do I want to say? 
And I didn't have a lot more to say. It just wasn't a habit of mine to think and pray that long. And so I just said, well, I'm, I'm serious about this. I want to be intentional about this. I'm going to open up my laptop and I'm going to write my prayers. I'm just going to get real intentional about this. And so I opened up the laptop and began typing what was in my heart. And what came to my heart was a question. Did Jesus know that it was going to last 40 days when he went in the wilderness? What did he do with the extra time that he wasn't expecting? And I thought of another. Did, did Moses know when he went up the mountain that he was going to be up there 40 days? And I want to focus on the Moses story for a minute. Number one, there's nothing in the account of Moses that says he did know that he's going for 40 days. He just knew that God was calling him up a mountain. Again, think disciples of a mountain, Moses of a mountain to be with. One day turned into two, into three, into a week, into a couple weeks, and 40 days. Finally, at the end of 40 days, God told Moses, I'm going to send you down to your people again now, but you need to know something. They have backslidden like you wouldn't believe while you've been up here with me. They're having an orgy down there. And you've got a lot of work to do when you get back. That was a big deal to me when I realized that because here's how I would have responded if I, not God, if I would have known what my people were about to do. I'd have said, Father, sorry, excuse me, but i got to go back down the mountain and attend to some business here. i, I got to prevent this miserable thing from happening. I wish we could spend more time together, but i gotta got to do this. God knew that his nation, his people, were falling apart in sin, and still he would not interrupt his time with Moses. It was more important to God that he be with Moses than that this travesty be prevented. Think about that, missionaries. Could you consider the notion that God being with you, you being with God, even where you serve, when there's tasks all around you, when there's unfinished business all around you, when there's even things going backwards sometimes all around you, could you let the notion seep in that time with you, not just your time with God, God's time with you is so big to him that he'd rather let some things fall apart than lose his time with you? He'd rather send you down and go with you at the end of 40 days and clean up a mess than just prevent it by not having this time with you. Here's what I hope is happening when you hear me today. Missionaries, those who help, those who support, those who serve at home, please know you're not just needed. You're not just being used. It's not all it's not even mostly about the task. Please know, let it sink in. You are wanted. And he called you on a first name basis. And you are so wanted that that's what makes heaven heaven for God. You are so wanted that he'd rather spend time with you where you're at, even while some things are falling apart then prevent the disaster from happening. That's how valued you are. I pray that this reality soaks in your heart and heals your understanding of yourself. I pray that this reality is called to your memory when you're serving someday and exhausted and you get one more demand, one more plea, one more request, please take care of this as well. Be like Jesus, sometimes just push away from the crowd. Go be with Father, not just for your sake, not just for your survival's sake, not just so you can tool up to do the task better tomorrow. You're just wanted that much. I pray that blesses you. My heart, my prayers are with you as you get some rest here and blessing here. And I pray some of this goes back to your field with you as well. God bless you.